Okie doke, so welcome to our trainer top tip session. Uh, we are here today as part of the Further and Higher Education Carbon Literacy Focus Day. So this is coinciding with the Youth Empowerment Day at COP26. Much of our team are up there today. Uh, we're holding down the fort in Manchester and hosting a day's worth of events uh, through most of the days during COP, uh, just to showcase and highlight lots of the amazing stuff happening in the different sectors that we work in. So we are here live on Zoom today. We're also streaming throughout the day on YouTube and this session will be uh, recorded. So we're here today to give you some top tips and advice uh, to any trainers, whether you're new or experienced. Uh, and we have here um, as well as myself. So I'm, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Chloe. I'm higher education coordinator at the Carbon Literacy Project. Uh, I'm also a certified trainer. Um, I used to deliver training as a student and then as a staff member at Manchester Metropolitan University. We're also joined by Anna, a student trainer and our fantastic higher education placement student uh, from Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, we're joined with Will Moody, who is a um, student trainer at the University of Cambridge. And then we also have um, Matt Woodthrop here, who is a trainer at EAUC Scotland. So Anna, uh, if you could um, just click through the things I wanted to talk about. So, these topics that I wanted to talk about today are the sort of most typical things that um, people within the sector ask me questions about and sort of common misconceptions and just bits of advice that I think uh, would be most helpful for trainers in universities and colleges. So the first one is preparation, and this is just knowing your material really well. It seems like a bit of an obvious one to state, but I wanted to put it in here just because people are now in universities getting to the point where they're starting to think about delivering training face to face again. Uh, and I think most people with the university toolkits uh, being released during the pandemic are very much uh, used to and comfortable delivering online now. Um, there are, of course, pros and cons to each and different people prefer different things. Uh, but the main thing with delivering online, I think, is the ability to have your notes and to be, you know, nobody's going to notice if you are reading uh, and constantly checking notes to the side of you on another screen, for example. And I think that is a huge um, benefit of delivering training online, but a comfort that um, we may not be able to rely on for much longer. So if you're at the point where you're thinking of transitioning from online training to face to face training, I would really encourage you to make sure that you know your stuff really well, because you might um, struggle um, as I have done with um, yeah adjusting to not being able to have your notes sneakily next to you anymore. The next one would be manageable numbers. So people often ask what the sort of ideal number of learners for a carbon literacy session is, uh, to which we would advise sort of eight to 15 people. Um, so this is a sort of good enough group size to have lots of discussion, different points of view, but also manageable in terms of keeping people engaged, managing breakout rooms and discussions and things like that. So we'd advise eight to 15 would be optimal. Uh, and if you're training over eight people, you should always have a facilitator with you. I think for any training it's helpful to have a facilitator um, but certainly with online training and certainly if there are over eight people and um, just to help with you know tech issues, managing breakout rooms and keeping up that engagement which is a bit more challenging especially when delivering training online. Um, past that sort of 15 mark, we would generally advise if you're going for the slightly bigger numbers, you know, we'd never encourage you to have more than, say, 30 people in a session, although it has been done before. Um, we would generally advise to have sort of one extra facilitator per um, every five additional learners. So I think that's a general rule of thumb to go by. Um, and also, uh, it's worth noting that if you would like to um, be a facilitator, for example, or if you would like somebody to help facilitate your session, please do get in touch because we have a wealth of trainers who are interested in delivering training within the further and higher education sector. Uh, there's also the uh, trainer group called... Um, 
carbon literacy pioneers and that's a great place to sort of network with other trainers you can sign up via the trainer tab on our website um, and also to offer your help as a facilitator or request other people's help facilitating sessions uh, the next point i'd like to cover is around evidence collection. Um, so the key piece of advice I would give here is to collect evidence virtually. I think most people in the sector are doing this already, uh, but it makes your lives, uh, as well as admittedly our lives, much easier um, if you use a platform, for example, SurveyMonkey, or I know a lot of universities use Bristol online surveys, Google Forms, anything like that um, to collect your certification data at the end of the session. Um, so all you need to do is using the sort of standard participant details um, evidence form, you can just copy and paste the questions from that into something like SurveyMonkey. And then once that data is collected, you can just download it um, as an Excel spreadsheet, just export the data. And then all you have to do is um, check it over yourself. We'd always advise using the marking guide and all of the toolkits. Um, and then you can just ping it over to us in an email um, and it makes the data much easier um, to manage from both ends. In addition to that, I would say as well, if you can allocate time during your training session um, to gather that data and for learners to complete their evidence form, um, then that would be fantastic. Um, from my experience as a trainer, uh, when this hasn't been done, it can be a nightmare sort of chasing up learners and trying to get that uh, evidence form off them and can create a lot of unnecessary admin that could have been avoided. Uh, it also ensures that as many learners as, poss as possible get uh, certified at the end of the training. And lastly, um, it makes it easier for you to sort of manage and keep an eye on the sort of pledges that people are making. So again, referencing that um, marking guide that we have, um, you can sort of check, out, uh, check against that and make sure that the learners in your session are writing sort of um, appropriate things that aren't going to result in um, getting their certificate brought back to you and having the matter more um, information, which is, of course, again, more admin. Um, so we never just flat out fail a learner if their pledges, for example, aren't sufficient. Um, we'll just ask them for more information and give them another opportunity to get that certificate. But if the learners are doing that in the session, then you have the opportunity to sort of discuss people's pledges with them and gently push them sort of in the right direction and make it clear what sort of pledges that we're looking for um, so that they can hopefully get their certificate at the end of the training. And lastly, just on the topic of pledges again, um, so it's quite different how we would mark staff pledges compared to student pledges. Um, so you may have seen on our website and previous slides, etc., that we want um, all actions to be taken in the sort of context of where the training is taking place. Um, so for example, with university staff, we would want both their individual and their group action place to be a work-based one. Um, so within their universities, you know, this is where the most impact is going to be able to be made by those individuals. So we really want both of those pledges to be work-based actions. However, with staff, um, sorry, with students, we're lots more flexible with this. Um, so with students, many of them will take pledges to um, do with their housemates, with their family, with their friends, sports groups, community groups, any sort of club societies they're in, we would absolutely encourage that. Um, but please bear in mind that the flexibility isn't so much there with staff and we really are looking for two work-based actions there. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A. Um, we'll be hanging around to chat afterwards, but now I am going to pass on to um, some of our fantastic um, trainers that we have on the call now. So if we start with you, Anna, do you want to introduce yourself um, and then give your top tips and advice to trainers? Okay. Um yeah, I think my top tips are sort of in regards to um, training online. So I find it quite difficult sometimes in getting people to engage, particularly online um, compared to in person. So um, it's just kind of making people feel comfortable sort of saying, you know, you can have your camera on or off, whatever is preference to you and letting them know that they can, you know, either speak 
um, through the mic or sort of type in the chat and making sure that everybody is comfortable, but as well as ensuring kind of the accessibility aspects for that as well. So, um, but yeah, and then trying to engage them as much as possible because it can sometimes be quite difficult um, in there. But yeah, I think making them feel as comfortable as possible um, within those sessions is, yeah, one of my top tips. Um, and sorry, I've made a short list, but I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, but I think the one for me is the kind of ensuring that the positive aspect is getting across. So obviously climate change can be quite a negative topic. Um, and I think the best way is to sort of address the issue that it is a negative thing, but then ensuring that you end on the positive note of there is hope and there is action that you can take to um, make things better. So I'd always suggest doing, you know, highlighting the kind of bad aspects, but then making sure that you end it on a high note rather than the other way around. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. Um, that's really valuable. Um, so Anna has been uh, a student trainer for a couple of years at, at Manchester Met and, and has been involved in external training, training of students, even training of um, the university leadership uh, at Manchester Metropolitan. Um, so yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Anna. Um, can we pass now on to Will? Do you want to introduce yourself and give your top tips and advice? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Will. I'm a, a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, and we've uh, recently or in the last year set up uh, Carbon Literacy as a student run venture uh, at the university. Um, so everything is, is 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 student run. So we don't have uh, staff involvement per se. So I think we've got a, a slightly unique perspective uh, in that sense. So what we've done to try and or one of our tips that we found really useful is because we have uh, obviously students that come from a range of different backgrounds so we created a a trainer guide basically or trainer handbook and we basically use the material that gets given from the carbon literacy and we get everyone uh, that trains to have this basically the same kind of uh, prompts and questions for the breakout rooms because i think obviously breakout rooms are slightly different to when you do it in person because when you're in person you're in in groups you kind of eyeball each other but when you're in breakout rooms it's very much like you're in your your own little box doing it and it's quite difficult to know what's happening in in other training breakout rooms so to try and keep it as similar as possible across all the trainings and to make sure everyone covers the same kind of ideas we we do that and i think it's especially useful for pledges because people end up having quite like a good rapport with their um, with their individual trainer they have in their breakout rooms so quite often they end up emailing and getting into contact that way to to help with uh, to help with pledges um i think maybe another really important tip that we found especially is kind of signposting right at the start that's not a lecture and this is not your degree because i think like people are so used to especially online stuff now uh as soon as you go into like the zoom kind of format you go you camera off and you just sit there and, and like go into absorb information mode whereas like we like to try and signpost that like yeah we're not we're not like academics we, we this isn't like our job we're just here to try and help you and we, we want to discuss with you as much as uh, you want to discuss with us and we really want it to be a roundtable discussion i think signposting that off the start with really helps out and it really gets people engaged and it's, it's really interesting how many people suddenly then turn on their cameras and, and actually start to, start to engage rather than because i think sometimes when you sign up they just think it's going to be this this course that they have to endure but actually by the end of like people really really get involved in it you get some really nice discussions um and i think echoing uh, what anna said as well about uh, being open i think that kind of fits into to that idea of just making it a, a really open and a really like nice space to discuss things and and basically because uh, because uh, again you, you have such a range of people that, that are in, like in in terms of their journey with sustainability and i think getting them in the same room together and actually getting people to talk to each other uh, is, is really nice. So yeah, I think those would be the, the things that we found found really useful um, with the with the University of Cambridge specifically, yeah. Thanks for that, Will. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Zoom fatigue is very real, um, but the feedback that we um, have got from students, especially um, in that awful period of time when so many students were, you know, in lockdown, trapped in their halls, um, was that doing the carbon literacy training was a real uh, breath of fresh air just because of the sort of, you know, discussion and group inquiry nature of it um, in comparison to what they were getting from all of their lectures who had who had just sort of transitioned into doing everything via Zoom, which was, of course, very hard for them as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a big part of the, the beauty of carbon literacy. 
And Matt, would you like to go next and share screen as well? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Yep. So um, I'm Matt to just say I'm, I work for EAC Scotland as their program manager. Um, so EAC Scotland supports all um, universities and colleges in Scotland with funded by Scottish Government Council for sustainability work. So that's uh, doing carbon literacy to embedding sustainable development in courses through to leadership for sustainability as well. And we've been delivering carbon literacy training um, now just early this year. Um, so we've delivered it to about just over 100 participants from 12 institutions and organisations. Um, and just for reference, we've been using the Manchester Metropolitan University's um, slide deck for higher and further education as well. And we've kind of tweaked it for a bit of a Scottish focus where, where we can. So I've just got a, a, a very short presentation. So I'll just share that up. So hopefully you'll see it in a sec. So hopefully that should be good. Um, so this is um, based on our experiences to date, and I'll just share three of the team's trainer tips um, that they don't come in in a particular order. So tip one from us is to use up-to-date data from robust sources. Uh, a core part of carbon literacy training is participants having access to scientifically sound, robust data that's presented in an accessible and engaging way. And we feel that is actually shared and it's a strong underlying expectation from participants as well when they join the training. We've heard from participants during or after the course reflecting that they've been hesitant to communicate about climate change for fear of saying the wrong thing or unsure of what to believe when there are so many conflicting media pieces out there. So we as trainers can acknowledge it's a really congested and evolving space. So as a trainer, we have to regularly check our training content to make sure that it's robust, that it's transparent and it's up to date as possible. As a result, participants have said they feel more confident in developing their own sustainability knowledge uh, and interests and or signposting resources to others. In case you haven't come across them before, I really recommend checking out the, uh, the Carbon Brief and Our World in Data. Uh, these are really good websites with transparent data sources and the data is often displayed in a very engaging way. So people can often play with the data sets, which I think is really key again, and it really emphasizes what Carbon Literacy is about in terms of engagement, exploring uh, sustainability. I've also added SSN and EAC Scotland uh, as well. So particularly if you're looking for college or university admission profiles, um, since 2015-16, every college and university in Scotland has had to report to Scottish Government its admissions, and these are all displayed on the SSN website. Uh, if you're looking to profile as an example one institution, I really recommend University of St Andrews as the latest data, they've included international student travel and also procurement admissions for the first time. And also Glasgow Caledonian is a uh, university is another good exemplar example. And just here, this graph to, is to illustrate that data can change quickly, even within the higher and further education sector. So here is a figure from our latest Scottish College and University Sector Admissions Report, which we published this summer. If we were describing uh, to participants the scale of admissions between scope one and two five years ago, I'd be saying that emissions from electricity were slightly higher than emissions predominantly from heating buildings. However, fast forward just five years, and we see that the scope two emissions are now less than half of scope one emissions. And we also see the growing emissions from scope three, which is mostly due to institutions expanding what they're reporting. Um, just following from Anna's point about, you know, sh showing a positive story, you know, it's nice to show us this type of data sometimes uh, as it highlights key trends. And some of them are very positive, such as the rate of recent decarbonisation of UK electricity, which you can really see in this graph in the purple bar. Tip two uh, from us is engaging with uh, institutional sustainability leads in advance of delivering to staff and students the carbon literacy training. We found this has a number of benefits. For example, it improves the relevance of the training to participants as you can incorporate institutional net zero plans or sustainability strategies within the slides. An even better approach, particularly if you're delivering to larger groups, is to actually ask the sustainability lead for the institution to sit on the training and give them the opportunity to present materials. We found this really beneficial recently at EAC Scotland uh, as we're just finishing delivery of carbon literacy training to 75 managers within a large college. And by inviting the sustainability lead at the college to join and engage in discussions, the training was actively creating new connections within the college that didn't exist before. And as a result, people might feel more confident dropping uh, the sustainability lead in email in future now that they've actually met uh, virtually in training. And then from the perspective of the sustainability lead, um, they received some really constructive feedback uh, for this particular case. So for example, 
despite the college having a sector leading uh, emissions target of net zero by 2030, very few of the managers had actually heard about it. So although it was really disappointing for the uh, sustainability community to hear, they also acknowledged that it's really powerful data and it recognized that they could do a lot more comms work uh, within the college itself. They also heard in the session about old lighting still being used in the theater areas, which may, may now form a, a new campus lighting project that otherwise might have been picked up a lot later. Um, so to wrap up this tip, uh, do reflect who is in the training, but also who isn't in the training. And can we as trainers help develop and strengthen connections and relationships within or between institutions, if you've got a mixed group, as an additional benefit of the training? And then finally, tip number three. You know, support and cultivate further interest and recognize the importance of follow up communications. Our experience is that many participants, um, this is the first time they've done or had the opportunity to engage with formal climate change education, and that can be a little daunting. So our role as trainers is really to support and cultivate uh, participant interest. So as I mentioned uh, before, we use the um, slides online, and it's a blend of self study with two four hour online sessions. And we found this is a really beneficial format for both the participants as well as us as trainers. Firstly, it allows people a chance to take in and mull over the course content between the self-study and the online sessions. Uh, and during the sessions, we, you know, we really encourage discussions and asking of questions, but we also make a note of these questions and of any key themes that create good discussions or debates. Then at the end of each session, when we're sending out uh, our communications, for example, after we finish it, um, session one we're sending on further uh, further self-study or you know we're sending out pledge information after session two we also include further in signposting based on the group's individual uh, discussions in the previous session we found this a really nice experience that it helps validate someone's interest in a particular topic uh, even if it isn't always shared by the group as a whole or and even if the signposting runs counter to what the participant was advocating for the really nice thing is that they've been heard and we've taken the time to explore the topic further and share findings. This may also help particularly uh, quieter participants as again, they feel seen. We have wondered actually how many people uh, read up the follow-up material and we've been pleasantly surprised so far. Uh, for example, at the start of the session two uh, online, we give each participant one minute to share their key takeaways from the previous session. Some of, the, uh, some of the participants have referenced the further reading that we shared in the, in the comments between the sessions and shared their appreciation for the support given to, us, um, given to them by us as facilitators. And then finally on this point, I just want to say, you know, it's a great opportunity for us as trainers to learn as well. Uh, for example, I popped it on the right hand side, but we were asked if we, we, we knew if there was a gender difference uh, with regards to per capita emissions. And the answer is no, we didn't. Um, so we did some really homework after the session and we found only this paper from 2009 that determined that men on average had emissions footprints of uh, 2.1 tonnes of a CO2 equivalent, more than women uh, across four European countries. It's a really good question uh, and I learned something new from the reading the research paper and who knows, putting that back out there, that might spark a student or a staff member to think about it as a research project in future. Um, so that was a uh, fair bit for me, so I'll stop there uh, and I hope that was of use. So I'll stop sharing. Thanks so, uh, thanks so much for that, Matt. That was great. Um, touched on some really uh, key things relating to like the adaptability of our toolkits as well. Um, so as Matt said, you know they've condensed um, the course to be into um, just sort of two larger sessions, and you're absolutely welcome to do that within the trainer guidance. It suggests that you deliver it in certain size chunks, etc. But whatever works for your audience and your institution, we're happy for you to do that. Uh, we're happy for you to add local context, we'd absolutely encourage it. And of course, keeping the science and references really up to date is super important. We try our best to do that with all of our toolkit courses at the project. But if you think, um, you know, you've come across uh, a certain figure or source um, that's, you know, more up to date or maybe more effective at getting the point across, please do tell us. And um, we want all of these materials to be super, you know, co-created by the sector. Uh, and we're keen to get um, any trainers input um, on the sort of future of those materials. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, Matt. Um, I see we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, so Claire asked, what would be the smallest size group that you would advise? Um, see, that's a difficult question. I have delivered to 
two people before um, in my student training days at Manchester Met. Um, obviously, it's not um, a great use of the trainer's time and not necessarily cost effective training, um, but the training actually went really well. And we had fantastic discussions and obviously the impact was low because it was only two people, but it still felt like a really good training. So there isn't a rule on how small the training um, can be. Obviously, with it being so discussion based, we would advise that there are multiple people um but yeah there's no rule on on how small you can go really um i hope that answers that question uh and then somebody else has asked will be sent these slides afterwards so uh i can certainly send you my single slide um and then matt uh would you be happy to share the eauc ones yeah no uh, problem at all Fantastic. So um, Matt will send those slides to me and then I can, um, I notice you're an anonymous attendee, but if you could email uh, me at education at carbon um, so I know who you are and can send you those slides, that would, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, so now I'm not sure if there's anything else that um, our trainers in the call wanted to share or as well if there are any um, trainers in the audience, uh, obviously if you're on YouTube or something we can't hear from you but if you're in uh, the Zoom audience then we can unmute your microphone if you wanted um, to chat, we're happy to hang around uh, for a few more minutes, um, I believe this session um, is booked until quarter to. So if anybody else has anything they'd like to ask, um, please do let us know if any of our trainers on the call uh, want to add anything else. Can I just really quickly echo what Matt said about the embeddings? I think that was super important and it's worked really well uh, at our university as well. I think having an idea of like the, the ecosystem of your university in terms of uh, sustainability is really important because yeah, as, as you say, like carbon literacy should be the not be the end of something, it should just be the start of something. And I think being able to signpost people to to where they can go to find out more about what they've been super passionate about is really interesting. And I think that's like almost almost as, as important as, as the training itself, because it's the, the training is kind of like the springboard, which allows people to then go and explore what really like gets them interested in sustainability. So, yeah. We, we've tried to do that in terms of obviously giving people resources about university and try to get some kind of like a Slack channel community going with people that are alumni of the course. And I think that works really well. So yeah, exactly as Matt says, just like trying trying as much as you can. It's, it's really difficult to, to keep up the engagement, but I think people do really appreciate it. And it really does give people some insights into, into what they can do next, because otherwise it, it kind of seems like it at the end of the course and you don't know what to do. It, it can feel a bit daunting. So I think helping people as much as you can to, to take that next step is, is really great. Yeah, absolutely. It's part of um, the, carb, uh, the carbon literacy standard that we accredit courses against, uh, that we want um, in all training materials to have, you know, signposts to local initiatives or in the case of a university, things that are happening at the university. I found when I worked in uh, ManMet's environment team, when I was delivering training there, um, a lot of the learners uh, didn't know we had an environment team. Um, and, you know, we were at a point in the scene where we really wanted to be engaging with more students. So carbon literacy was really um, helpful in, in being able to kind of create those connections between staff and students as well, which was really nice um, and help that sort of sense of community within the university rather than the, the kind of us and them um, feeling that I think um, can, can, can occur. Oh, we've got a couple more questions in. Um, anybody else managed to split cohorts? Um, so Susie, are you talking about splitting academics and students or having academics and students within the same cohort? Susie, I should just, um, shall I unmute you? <laughs> Both in the same bunch. Okay, I haven't muted you, um, Susie, but um, you don't have to. You don't have to come and uh, talk. I can just answer um, from the Q and A. 
Um, in the same bunch we have, um, I say we, like I still work at ManMet. Um, at ManMet, we did um, run some mixed cohorts. And again, I did get the sense that that um, kind of helped with that, again, that sort of sense of community. And there was um, something really nice about getting you know, university staff from estates, for example, who, who would really, really interact with students to have these like great um, conversations with students. It was really nice. Um, but I do also find that um, staff and students maybe it's the same with mixing things vertically in terms of like having leadership and then um you know middle management staff um in the same session i find that people might hold back on conversations and opinions and discussions a little bit and be more careful what they say if they are in more of a mixed group which is a negative of that uh, i'm not sure if um matt anna or will you have anything to add to that or any experience of um mixing those kind of groups I think so personally it's quite good because as a student at my university there's like as you said like lots of students didn't weren't aware that there was an environmental team and I feel like there's many things that I don't know as a student that staff are doing particularly and things that are going on that when I am in carbon literacy session training sessions with staff like the amount of things that I learn and different things I think there's quite a gap between sort of students and um university staff unfortunately in terms of kind of what's happening with um the climate action things that are going on at the university so i think it is quite beneficial in combining them at least in some way um because obviously it's all about you know like getting everybody together working towards the same goal so i think it is really beneficial having everybody's voice in the same room but i think as well as chloe said you have the slight negative side of people might feel unable to say certain things because of the difference in um yeah, people's like levels, I suppose, within the university or the organization. Yeah. Matt or Will, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say at, at the University of Cambridge, we've done um we have we haven't quite done staff as students, but we've done um undergrad, postgrad, and postdoctoral research as well. So we've not quite gone to the staff, but we've managed to get the mix. And I think again, yeah, it works really nicely because you get a diversity of uh, of like age as well as uh, everything else that you would get with carbon literacy, which I think is really nice. Uh, the other thing that I would say is uh, like, I guess if you were including staff, you'd probably just have to adapt some, or at least for us, because ours is quite student and postdoc focused, just adapt some of the material and signposting for the staff because it, it would be different for them. So stuff like student societies and things like that, you'd have to come up with some, some alternatives uh, and uh, ways for them to get engaged that so they don't feel disengaged or that the, the course isn't for them because it's just student focused so yeah I, I think it's definitely doable and I think like Anna said having people or having people conversing that wouldn't normally converse is is great it's just making sure that it, it feels like it, it's for them as well as for students as well so I think as long as you've done that it's, it's a really great idea Yeah, I mean, I, for me, as uh, Scotland said, we haven't um, had students and staff mixed groups. Um, but I guess kind of maybe just build on um, this discussion and Susie's point uh, in the Q&A as well about some colleges liking to mix senior staff, technicians, support staff, et cetera, or keep them separate. Um, not necessarily a tip, but a reflection that, you know, we've, we've done sessions where it's multiple institutions and staff joining a session. We've had more recently, you know, this one college where all the managers are joining. And it does create different dynamics, not necessarily uh, better or worse than each other, but just different. And what we find maybe is that with the mixed groups, if you have multiple institutions, you don't necessarily have the formal hierarchies that might occur in an institutional session. So you might have a senior leader being challenged by a support staff um, because they're on different institutions. So they feel like the formal hierarchy can be ignored a bit more, which is really nice. Um, and an example, for example, with a, a senior manager, it was quite strongly believed that you, you shouldn't tell people what to eat, but he was in control of the catering contract. So it was recognized by another, other people in the groups that, well, actually, by you not choosing to reduce or look, look at what's in the college's um, menus, you are making a choice for people. Uh, you, you know, you can't ignore that. And it's interesting because I think if that happened with just within the college staff, that debate might not have occurred, but because there was people from different areas, it did. Um, but then it, on the flip side, if you have everyone within a college uh, joining the session, you do get those new connections starting, which are really powerful. So again, I, I'd put it as, you know, there's benefits to both rather than there's negatives. It's just different. 
Sorry, yeah. I'd say as well to add on, sorry, Chloe, because um, I know within our train the trainer sessions, we have had a lot of kind of um, staff and students, and I think it quite helps to further um, implement um, carbon literacy training kind of across the university and like embedding it in different um, like subject matter sort of thing. So like in, it's very much within our um, science department at our university. And then I think having both staff and students coming together. And then I think now that the business school is um, implementing more training there and it's kind of having, obviously there's so much that students can do, but they need um, staff to sort of facilitate and enable that as well. And I think having them, particularly within the train and training sessions has really helped to expand the carbon literacy project, at least at, um, um, man met as well. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I really like that framing, Matt, as well, that um, there's positives to both. Um, yeah, training can be hugely impactful, um, whether it's delivered sort of with um, vertical or horizontal diversity. And that's as well in terms of, you know, who's delivering the training as well. I think that was um, something really amazing that Manchester Met did uh, when they had, you know, their student trainers training their senior leadership which is just the coolest like sort of um change of change of power um but from what i've had it was uh it was a fantastic session leadership responded really well to it um so yeah there's there's all sorts of different uh ways that you can deliver carbon literacy um and susie you're a fantastic experienced trainer i'm sure it'd be fantastic regardless um, we've had somebody ask, as a trainer, do you need to deliver to organizations and clubs, et cetera, or can it be to friends and family? Um, so this is probably one for somebody from the project to answer. Um, you can deliver, in theory, carbon literacy to absolutely anyone. Um, if you are um, a new trainer and you want to um, deliver to friends and family, we'd absolutely encourage you to do that. There's lots of training that happens within community groups. It's not all in um, sort of workplaces and things like that. Um, and it's not all in universities. Um, so if you're in a position where you've got, you know, friends and family you want to train, you can definitely do that. I would advise if you haven't already to get in touch with us just to make sure that you're up to speed on the sort of admin procedures around um, getting your learners um, certified after the course and other things you might need to be aware of as a trainer when delivering it sort of independently outside of a workplace. Um, but yeah, there are there are no limits really to, to how you want to deliver carbon nursing you want to um, deliver it to. Uh, you'll just need an accredited course um, with you to, to do that. Um, but yeah, if you get in touch, then we'll be able to advise further on that. I think that's all of um, I think that's all of our questions now. Anybody else? Sorry, could I just add on to obviously what Matt was saying about um, ensuring that the data is all up to date? I think it's really important to also ensure that you really understand it as well. Because I know within our training, there's like, you know, big graphs with all these like lines and numbers on, and it could be quite overwhelming trying to get like absorb all that information. Even as a trainer, I find it quite difficult to get my head around as well. But obviously, it's a really important part of the issue of climate change and also understanding it and then realizing the magnitude of it as well I suppose and then taking action so ensuring that you as a trainer really understand like not just you know all the obvious like facts and things but also the figures and graphs that you're showing as well so that you can explain it in the best way that everybody can understand it really well and go away like knowing exactly um yeah all the ins and outs of it. Yeah, definitely. I know that's brilliant advice. Um, I think one of the um, other beauties of carbon literacy is that, um, you know, you're not supposed to be an expert. You're supposed to be a facilitator for learning. Of course, you should know all of your material and every figure back to back. Um, but, you know, you are always um, learning alongside um, the people in your session. And I think we've all echoed that today is that, um, you know, you always learn something new from the participants. Um, and I think that's a really lovely part of it. Um, but I think particularly when delivering in higher education, it can be difficult to not be seen as an expert. For example, if you're delivering to a, a group of academics, um, they will 
probably expect you to, <laughs> to be an expert and it's kind of um, it's kind of harder to play and enjoy that kind of I'm not an expert I'm a facilitator for learning um, approach uh, because I think there is more of an expectation um, to have that expertise within higher education which makes it all the more important to um, to really know your stuff and everything that you're delivering uh, especially when you're using one of the pre-made toolkit courses that you might not have um, might not have written yourself. Um, I think that's everything. Yes, it is. Well, we've got um, a couple more minutes left in the session. So if there's any more last minute questions um, that people want to put in, please do so. Um, if not, next up, we have um, an interview with Steve Frampton, who's the Climate Commissioner at the Association of Colleges. And we're going to be talking all about um, what's happening in further education relating to carbon literacy. Um, but yeah, still a couple more minutes if anybody else wants to post um, a last minute question. We'll also have as well, um, myself and Anna at the end of the day, um, just loitering on Zoom for anybody else who wants a sort of informal discussion or ask any more questions. Um, that slot was supposed to be with Queensland University in Australia, um, but time zones meant that they couldn't partake live and they couldn't um, in the end get, get together a sort of pre-recorded presentation in the end, unfortunately. Um, so they're going to be featuring in, in the next kind of day like this. But in place of that, um, myself and Anna um, will, be, will be here for any, any more chats or questions, anyone. So I think that's that's it for everyone. I think we're all chatted out now. So um, we'll end this session uh, and move on to the next one. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much to our um, amazing trainers who have volunteered to share um, some of their wisdom today. Um, it was a really nice session. Uh, you'll be able to watch it back, and I will share the slides with anybody who wants them. Um, we'll be using um, clips from this on, on our website and, and in social media and stuff like that in the weeks to come. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you at the next session if you're coming to that. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.